When I was a teenager, I survived several suicide attempts and also the plan to commit several more. To me, I feel that it's time for some definitive closure uh, since I've never been able to talk to anybody about these events since no one cared. I uh, brought my boxing gloves. I bought them at the uh, Decathlon, the cheap ones. <laughs> That's to fight off tears if that were necessary. I don't know if it's going to be necessary. I don't know what this video is going to be like. I'm primarily making this video for myself to go through those horrible years when I was a teenager from age 10 to around age 19 when I suffered extreme depression, chronic depression and thoughts of suicide. Now this is part of a video series called Raised by Narcissists. I believe both my parents were extreme narcissists, like with the full-blown narcissistic personality disorder, that they used me as their scapegoat child to accuse me and blame me of everything uh, was wrong with them, really. Uh, I also felt invisible, you know, neither seen nor heard. Uh, you can watch my other videos where I detail the different facets of the abuse that I say I suffered. By the time I was 10 years old, I started having thoughts of suicide. I remember the exact moment when I had these thoughts for the first time. Uh, my father had this bizarre fetish of going on family holidays at each summer to drive the car in a little caravan in tow to France, and then we would visit the mass graves of the Americans and of the Germans and the French of the Second World War. We would visit a mausoleum, that's a museum for bones, where they've collected soldiers' bones, thrown them all together. I remember walking on this plexiglass floor and you could see through it to see, you know, crates full of bones from anonymous soldiers. And this is bizarre, right? Like, we did this at least five or six years in a row, where my father would go to these very depressing World War II memorials throughout Western Europe, especially France. And it was when we were at a certain fort, I forgot the name of it, a French fort. I don't know if it was built by the French or probably by the Germans to defend themselves against any American invasion. And it was there that I remember consciously thinking that I don't want to live anymore. Now, the reason I didn't want to live anymore obviously has more to do with just those vacations, those strange war vacations. Though the scenery, the setting certainly contributed to my, you know, uh, fledgling depression that would last for almost 25 years. This type of depression feels as a literal pain in your brain. I could even point it out. It feels like somewhere here, quite high up in my skull, is this constant pressure, almost painful, that you feel in your brain. Uh, and I understand now people say, oh, it's just a chemical disbalance or something, but it wasn't. It's not a chemical disbalance. I was born an extroverted, happy child, verbal, you know, expressive. I loved talking and running around and singing and so on and so forth. Uh, it was actually the suppression of my extroversion that I believe kickstarted my depression. Suppressed extroversion, by which I mean you are, as me, a talkative person, but you are severely punished for it. You are told to shut up, to be quiet. You are told also not to be seen, to play out of sight of the parents, that you are unwanted in the living room. I remember that as a small child living in an apartment in Belgium at, in those days. I'm Dutch, but uh, I was born in the Netherlands and then when I was one day old, they moved me to Belgium where I lived, the, spent the first three years of my life there near Antwerp. And we were living in a small apartment and I remember that whenever our dad was home, uh, wherever my father was home, he didn't want to hear us. And that meant my mother locked us up in our little bedroom me and my baby brother. 
we weren't allowed to come into the living room to make noise because it would upset our father. My father had, uh, even then already, alcoholic problems. He was an alcoholic since he was around 25 years old. And I was born when he was 29 or so. And his alcoholism wouldn't stop until I was 33, 34 years old. So I knew my father only as this alcoholic man who was not interested in his children whatsoever. And he would only yell at us at the top of his lungs, telling us to stop making those sounds coming from your mouth, telling us to go play in the garage or go play outside or go play in the attic. But even if we did that, if we would play in the garage or if we would play in the attic, the noises our feet made when we would walk around, the stomping, that boom, 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 even that would upset him. And then he would come into the garage and into the attic to tell us to even stop moving at all. It's very clear that we were unwanted as children. Now, the same applies to my mother. I don't know why my mother had children. She also didn't love us, right? I can go into that in another video. But the combination of all the sorts of, all the different facets of narcissistic abuse that you can get, physical abuse, physical neglect, uh, emotional abuse, emotional neglect, psychological abuse, psychological neglect, psychological invisibility, and so on and so forth. All these things combined is what made me depressed. So it's not a chemical disbalance. I do not buy into that theory at all. It is years of chronic abuse and neglect that led to me being depressed and suicidal, basically feeling as though I shouldn't have been born. I was unwanted, undesired. I shouldn't have been there. So my depression starts at age 10, which is very early for a person to start. You've, you've barely lived at all and already you no longer want to live because you, you are suicidal. When I was 11 years old, I had my first plan to commit suicide. I even told my baby brother about it. Um, I wrote a sort of goodbye letter. I taped it. In, in this duct tape so that it would be difficult to unwind it if anybody found it. Uh, what I did was I had learned to tie a noose. I had a little rope from the hardware store, all right, and I tied a noose, I put it around my neck, and I put a jacket on top of it. Now in my bedroom had a door to the outside on the first floor, door to the outside. Normally you would have expected a balcony there, but instead there was just this metal fencing. So, 11 years old, I still fit between the fencing and the door when you close the door. And uh, it was a bit cold outside, but you see, the original plan had been for me to tie the other end of the rope to the fencing and jump down, snapping my neck. I even understood that. Yeah, I understood that because I'd watched uh, American uh, Wild West movies that you needed to snap your neck. I understood all those things already. I'd looked into those things, but I couldn't do it. Uh, I didn't do it. I do remember that my baby brother told my parents who were watching TV downstairs and I could hear them just laugh at all. They didn't even come upstairs to check on me until an hour later. Uh, throughout all these years that I was suicidally depressed, I remember very well that I didn't want to be dead. I didn't want to die. I just couldn't live on anymore. It's not true that people who commit suicide are weak or something. It's that they had to be strong for too long and they give up. They give up on being strong because in my case, in my narcissistic household, no one supported me. Even though I was the firstborn child, I was the bottom of the pack. I was the least desired child, I believe. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I remember lying on the floor in my bedroom, holding a sort of pocket knife that I had sharpened first, and I held it over my heart. And I wanted to, to jab it right into my heart but I couldn't do it. See, a lot of, uh, what, is, what is an attempt? You know, what is a suicide attempt? Um, in my view, you prepare for suicide, you prepare what you need, and you are basically there at the start of it to do it. That's, 
that's the beginning of an attempt. Uh, when I was 13 years old, I kept thinking of this idea to hang myself. This time I would ride to school on my bike in the early morning. I would have a noose around my neck underneath my jacket and I would bike to school with that thinking that when I reached this bridge, this uh, viaduct, as we call it in the Netherlands, uh, there was this, you know, metal fencing there, a railing that I could tie the other end to it and jump off in front of the traffic so that, say, truck drivers would see me dangling right before their windshield. I didn't do that. I wanted to, I tried to do these things. I mean, I'm only a child, you know, and do you know what it feels like when you're 11, 12, 13 years old, you try to commit suicide because you're already at that point where you are so depressed you don't want to live anymore. No one cares about you. No one loves you. No one recognizes you. You're an unwanted child, neither seen nor heard. And then you can't even kill yourself. This really ate me up on the inside that I'm such a loser, I can't even kill myself. Right? Think about that for a moment. I'm such a loser, I can't even kill myself. I felt even more depressed than I already was because I didn't have the courage to jump. When I was 14 years old, I, I went to school and I think the first lecture I was there, but I skipped the second lecture. I instead, when everybody else was in their classrooms, I put on my coat again, my jacket, went outside. I even walked past the windows of my own uh, classmates who could see me. And I thought, I thought that teachers were gonna like open the window and shout at me or something like, hey, hey, hey get back in class, get back in school or something. But they didn't do anything. Uh, I walked past the outside windows and I walked past the Wilhelmina channel in the town where I was living. Uh, and I walked past it, one bridge, two bridge, and I think it was the third bridge I re reached because I didn't want to do this in sight of everybody. It, it was snowing outside, the snow was coming down, it was freezing, I believe it must have been in November or so. Uh, it was cold. I got to this bridge in the thick snow, I walked up to the bridge, to the railing, and I looked over it and I saw this pitch black water flowing away from me. Of the, the water is in the Wilhelmina channel. And I saw these thick, and I also saw these thick sheets of ice slowly flowing away from me. That's how cold it was, that the river had been frozen over. My intention was to jump in. I figured that the river water would be so cold in the winter time that if I jumped in, it would shock my muscles into like some kind of catatonic state and I would just drop like a brick to the bottom, drown, and that would be it done. Instead, you know, I didn't do it. I did hope for cars to stop. I think secretly I hoped that someone would stop their car and say, hey kid, are you all right? Do you need help? But no one did. Plenty of cars drove by, but no one talked to me, no one stopped me, no one stopped to wonder, hey, why aren't you in school? You know, what are you doing? It turns out that in our society in the Netherlands, people don't talk to each other. They do not, people really mind their own business in there. If there's a kid over there trying to commit suicide, who cares, right? We got other things to do. I stood there by that railing for a while. And I, and I ordered myself to make a decision, either to jump in or to face life, no matter how hard it is. And mind you, for me, there was nothing. There was no life to live. At home, I was you know, the victim of two narcissistic parents, like I told you, who treated me as the scapegoat child who didn't care about me at all. School was no different. Teachers just care about your performance, about your grades and your exams, and they didn't care about me personally. I felt that I was between a rock and a hard place. There was no life for me at home and no life for me at school. And since we didn't do extracurricular activities because our family wasn't rich, uh, I would have liked to go do uh, ice hockey or something, but we didn't have money for things like that. 
uh, I could have done piano lessons, but my mom said, you're too stupid to do, to do piano lessons. Later, I taught myself how to play the piano a little bit. Uh, but this just goes to show what kind of parents I have. You know, anytime I came up with a suggestion that I could do something outside of school hours, the answer was always no, either you're too stupid or we don't have money, right? I was, in this sense, a financial burden to my parents. They didn't, they didn't want me, and that meant that everything I needed, like food and clothing and extracurricular activity, all these things were just represented a cost they were not willing to pay. They didn't want to spend money on me to have a life. But just to give you an example of how poor exactly we were, by the time I was 15 years old, I would go to school in sweaters from the 1960s, from the hippie era. This was in the early 1990s when I went to school. 30-year-old clothes that were handed down by several generations of people to me uh, because we couldn't afford to buy clothes. We were that poor. We didn't have proper food at home. So I already was an unwanted child, and now I'm a financial burden as well, right? So I'm 14 years old, and I'm looking at the horizon in the snow, and I'm telling myself to make that decision. And I imagined, I did something strange, I imagined that my future self, my 28-year-old future self, had come back to me, had come to me back in time. And I, and I imagined my future self to promise me that life was going to get better for me that I was going to have friends, that I was going to find some love, a girlfriend, right? And it is that promise I made my future self made to myself. <laughs> uh, I know that sounds strange, but that's what I did to convince myself that I should face life. It didn't quite work out like that. Yes, life did significantly improve uh, but much later than I expected. It didn't really start improving uh, noticeably until after I was age 34, 35, when I went full no contact with my parents. And I never really found good friends. I think even until today, I cannot say that I've ever had real friends that I care to remember. Uh, most people who I called my friends because I wanted to be friends with them, they saw me as the schmuck at dinner for schmucks. They just abused me, right? And I, being the victim of narcissistic parents, tolerated this abuse because I thought that's how life is done. I didn't know that you don't have to tolerate abuse. I didn't know that you have the right to stand up for yourself and tell people to piss off. Even if that makes them angry, then you walk away, piss off, goodbye, right? I never learned to stand up for myself. I only learned to take abuse and a lot of it and then somehow tolerate the abuse expecting that the abusers will someday learn to love me or or learn to treat me better that never happens and has never happened in my life i don't think that i don't think it works that way people who are abusive towards you will never change but you can change by walking away or telling them to flip off you know When I was 15 years old, I filled the bathtub with cold water. My mother was on heart medication and I had read in the uh, booklet that this type of medication actually slows down your heart rate. So when I was home alone, one day I swallowed an overdose of my mom's heart medicine while I submerged myself in that, into that cold water, hoping that my heart would stop or I would slowly freeze to death, I suppose, or slowly die because of my heart rate slowing down. That didn't work. So I would say that this was my first real attempt where I actually put my body in physical danger. Uh, I, I must have spent a few hours in that cold water, but it didn't work. I was just cold. I was not even in hypothermia, nothing. It was just cold and I started vomiting or I had the sensation of wanting to vomit out the heart medication, which had no effect on me, really. When I was 16 years old, uh, in the middle of the night, I, and I had been planning for this like many months ahead, right? Uh, 
oftentimes during all these years, I would go to bed, go to sleep, wishing I wouldn't have to wake up in the morning. I wish I would die in my sleep. I, I can't remember the dozens of times, maybe even a hundred times that I went to bed hoping that I wouldn't have to wake up anymore, that I would just die in my sleep. And when we had school holidays, for example, like one or two weeks off for Christmas or another uh, holiday season, I would count down the days. I would enjoy my free days because without school, life at home became a bit more bearable. Uh, whereas with school added to it, I simply didn't have a life. I was just a machine, a robot, ordered to achieve certain uh, exams and grades and so on. And I didn't feel that there was any room for me to live a human life. But during the holidays, of course, during the day, I, ha I could do other things. I had hobbies. I could focus my time more on my hobbies during the day. And I wouldn't be so uh, double punished by both the narcissistic household I grew up in and the absolutely mechanical, soulless, a mindless school system of the Netherlands in the 1990s. So I'm 16 years old and in, at 4 a.m. I remember that because uh, I set the alarm for it. I woke up, I scribbled some mean words on my bedroom wall with a marker that I didn't want to ever go to school anymore. And my mother found me that morning lying in our backyard underneath our, the trees in our backyard. Uh, it was in the winter cold. I had attempted to hang myself, right? And in the end, I also attempted to break my own leg because I didn't want to go to school anymore. The real reason, of course, is that what I really wanted, but what I didn't quite understand yet was that I wanted to be loved. I wanted to feel loved, or at least feel that I deserved to be loved. I wanted to feel cared for, supported by my parents, who never supported me or cared for me. So my mother found me lying on the cold dirt floor in our backyard. She got me back inside, gave me one cup of tea, and five minutes later, I was in the car with her. She drove me off to school, and there I was solving math problems, and my teacher complaining why I hadn't done my homework. I understand that the school system isn't designed to care about children's psychological problems. Right. In the Netherlands, we normally don't have things like a school psychologist or something. I, I sometimes see that in American movies about high, American high school, you have a school physician and a school psychologist. We don't have that. Uh, I also want to tell you that when I was 13 years old, I tried to tell my father for the first time in my life that I had these depressed thoughts and I had been suicidal since age 10. And that uh, the year before, when I was 12, I had also attempted to jump out of those trees in our backyard. I was literally out on a limb. I had let go of my hands. I looked down to the pavement, to the concrete. Uh, and I, I intended to dive down head first, but right in that last moment, I was thinking to myself, what is to become of my baby brothers? If I do this, I have three younger brothers. What if I kill myself? What will happen to them, right? It's the thought of my younger brothers that kept me alive often. Is this thought of them that I shouldn't leave them behind with our abusive parents. That is the reason why I often pulled out of my suicide attempts and didn't do it. So I've got tears on running down my cheek, telling my father this story about that I wanted to jump out of the tree. My father doesn't respond. He's working on the VCR. VCR is an old recording system where you could record TV shows. Nowadays you have uh, hard disks or whatever, or USBs or whatever. Those days you had VCR cassettes to record TV shows. So my father was fixing the VCR machine. And when I was done talking, he turned like he was like crouching a little bit like so. And he, he turned to, to me to look me in, in the face. And he said to me, 
then you should have jumped. I was absolutely paralyzed when he said that. Uh, for a brief second, I looked my father in the eye, and it was as though I saw the pitch blackness, the gateways straight to hell. It felt as though I was in the presence of the devil, my father, or that my father was possessed by the devil in a flash like that. That's what it felt like. Because I looked my father in the eye, he looked me in the eye, and he said this to me, then I should have jumped. He didn't give me any support, he didn't help me, he didn't give me emotional, you know, uh, nothing, nothing. My father literally wished me dead. Okay, I was 13 years old, and my father wished me dead to my face, basically ordered me that I should have committed suicide. This was his assignment for me. You know, if there was any doubt in my head whether or not I was a wanted child, whether or not I deserved to be seen and heard and loved and cared for like any child wants, those doubts were gone. I knew in that very moment when I was 13 years old in 1993 in the Netherlands, I knew that my parents neither wanted me alive, nor would they care if I were dead. Because three years later, my mom finds me in the backyard, as I told you, and drives me off to the math class. We never spoke about this event ever again. She gave me that cup of tea and told me, hurry to go to school. You have to go to school, it's time. It's time to go to school. That's the only concern she had, that it was 8.30 in the Netherlands, and that means we, I, we, we have to be in school at 8.30. At least my school started at 8.30 8 a.m. That's her only concern, the only thing she cared about. When I was 18 years old, I attempted more strangulation by hanging myself. I tied the noose again, and this time I tied it around, for example, my doorknob to my bedroom, and I actually felt the rope cut into my throat. I also tried it with electric wiring around my throat, and that really cut into your throat. I also, by the time I was 19 years old, uh, put a bin bag, wrapped a bin bag around my head, with some elastic around it, so it would close tightly and not let any air in and out. And I remember that, yeah. I know what it's like when you're breathing inside of a bag and the CO2 level starts to rise in the bag because you're, you're using the oxygen and exhaling more CO2. And it turns out that after some at some point, at some level, when the CO2 level is too high, your brain enters a panic mode. And so what happened is, I start to panic and I'm fighting it, I'm fighting the panic, I'm holding my hands down, like, don't do it, like, don't scratch the bag open. But then, of course, <gasps> I scratched the bag open. Another attempt to kill myself failed. Again, I feel miserable. I was already depressed and suicidal. Now I feel miserable on top of that for the fact that I can't even kill myself. After this though, the attempts stop. Is it a coincidence that around this age, 2021, I moved out of my parents' house? I finally went to live on my own to study. Now my student years were just a shit really, it's just more education, more school system, more grades, more exams. Uh, I didn't make any real friends there. But this, the thoughts of suicide didn't really go away. But the attempted suicide, the attempts stopped. I never attempted suicide again. And the thoughts of suicide stayed with me until age 28 then went away for a few years, and then came back again around age 33, when I spent some time living back with my parents, and the same abuse I suffered as a child and a teenager 
came back to me again, driving me off the cliff again. Then I finally went full no contact. And full no contact to me finally meant that thoughts of suicide finally went away. Forever, for good, permanently. Now I managed to do the story without having to punch my tears away. I feel good that I did this video, that I could tell you about my suicide attempts. I've never told anybody before. No one cared. No one cared. No one cared. But I still cared. I still care. And it's been one of the most valuable things that I've learned to do in my life is to finally, ultimately, learn to care for myself and about myself. See, I was taught to hate myself. I was taught to believe I was an inferior creature who didn't deserve his life, who shouldn't have been here or shouldn't have been born. When I was 15 years old, I yelled at my father that I shouldn't have been born. You know, throughout my adult years, I often asked my parents, why did you have children? Why did you have us? Suggesting that they didn't really want us, they didn't care us, they didn't, they didn't care about us, they didn't love us. So. Uh, he didn't have proper answers to questions like that. If you are struggling with suicide, accept that it has a real world causes. It's not caused by a chemical disbalance. If there is a chemical disbalance measured in your brain, it is the consequence of real social problems that cause you to have the chemical imbalance. You don't solve that problem with pills and medication. You solve it by cutting loose from your abusers, by going no contact with your abusers and never talking to them again. And also by learning to very quickly cut loose from the so-called friendships yeah, with people who are only mimicking or continuing the sort of abuse you used to suffer. Those people are not your friends. People who abuse you are not your friends. Normal people understand that, but I had to learn that. I had to learn that people who hurt me, abuse me, humiliate me, like lower me, belittle me, right? Spit on me, hit me, right? Threaten to hit me, threaten with violence, that such people are not my friends. I didn't know that. Seriously, that's how strange abuse can be. If you've been the victim of chronic abuse, you don't know that people who treat you poorly have no right to do so. You think that's how life is. You think that you prove yourself worthy by tolerating the abuse, by allowing it to continue to happen, rather than to put an end to it and say, fuck off.